recording. So welcome to Math 150. This is lecture 10. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to continue with our discussion on vectors. So we're going to talk about equations of lines, equations of planes, and then we're going to get into some new materials with the dot product. It is possible to define almost anything you want in mathematics. The question is which definitions are going to be useful. The dot product is an extremely useful definition. And in fact, you've seen applications of it already. We just haven't formally isolated it. So the homework that's due for the next class will be the problems from section 12.3. And I will put those again at the end of the slides. I have tried to estimate how many blank pages I need for various parts of the lecture. So some of these may be moved around a little bit afterwards. Try to talk again about equations of lines because it's such an important concept. Differentiation, big idea is locally complicated function looks like a straight line. For a function of two variables, locally it's gonna look like a plane and higher and higher. So we need language on how to do this. So uh, one of the things we had was, you know, equation of a line. We had y minus y naught is m x minus x naught. And I can parametrize this in one dimension. I'm oh, sorry, well, I guess it's technically two dimensions in the plane. And I can say, you know, uh, I somehow switched to the eraser. Let x equal x naught plus, and then some amount t, y would be y naught plus what? So if x is x naught plus t, what would y naught be? So we know y minus y naught is m x minus x naught. So y would be y naught plus m x minus x naught. But what is m minus x? What is x minus x naught? What does that equal? T. So I can write this if I want as you know x y, or maybe more formally x of t y of t is equal to x naught plus t, y naught plus mt. Or I can write that as the point x naught y naught plus one m t. This is another way of writing an equation of a line in the plane. We've seen three different ways of writing an equation of a line in a plane. Here's a fourth. Why is this a really good way? Well, if I wanted to generalize to three dimensions, four dimensions, five dimensions, okay, x naught, y naught, and in the shocker, z naught. Now, the only thing that's interesting here is I'm writing the vector as one and m. One step in the x direction, and then m steps in the y direction. I am saying one direction is special. Which direction am I saying is special? Which direction am I saying is special when I'm writing it as one and M? The X direction, the Y direction, or third direction? When you look at this, which do I seem to be making special? Yes, which one? So which, which direction? The X direction, the Y direction, or a third direction? Okay, so when, if it's the third one, what's the direction? When I'm writing the vectors one comma M, which component am I making in some sense nice? The X, I'm basically saying adjust the direction I'm moving, reseal that vector so the X component is one comma M. If I give you, for example, um, X, let's say X of T, Y of T, equals x naught y naught plus two two m, you know, I hate using the letter S, but I use the letter S. I could consider this line. This is the same as x naught y naught plus one m two times S. Let T equal two S or S equals T over two. 
It's the same equation of the line. I've just changed the magnitude of the vector, but I haven't changed its direction. 2, 2m two is in the same direction as 1, 1m. One if I give you a vector, I just want to adjust it and standardize it to make the first coordinate 1. So trying to make the x coordinate 1. I'm just trying to standardize. When you look at parabolas, we often normalize the parabola so that the leading coefficient, the x squared coefficient, is 1. just makes it a little bit nicer. I'm just trying to adjust to make my x coordinate 1 for my vector. I'm really writing this as you know, x of t, y of t is you know, x naught, y naught, plus some vector v times t. And what I'm saying is if I give you a vector, can I always adjust a vector so that it has the same direction and the x coordinate is 1? Is that always possible? So for example, if I give you v equals 2, 3, what's a vector that's in the same direction with an x coordinate of 1? So I want a vector same direction x coordinate 1. What would you guess? One and what was the other one? 1 1.5 or 3 halves. Either way works. You know, it's not always going to be nice and integers, but I can do that. If I give you v equals negative 3, 6, what would I choose? I want something in the same direction with the x coordinate equal to 1. 1, negative 2. So am I always able to do this? Is there any vector where I can't do this? Yes. OK, that's 1. Give me more general. So if the vector is 0, 0, I can't do that. But then if the vector is 0, 0, I'm not moving. So it's not really a line, it's a point. So, yeah, if I give you anything, danger. What if V equals, you know, zero M? Cannot do. And if you think about it, what does it mean if X is zero M? I don't need to move anything over in X to go up. What's my, what, what kind of equation of line, what kind of line do I have if the vector is zero M? It's a vertical line. And if you look at what happens, you know, if I go to the general case when V has a zero X component, X is just constant. And then Y is going to be going up and down. So what's nice is this allows me to talk about what happens if I have a vertical line. If I have a horizontal line, well, that's easy. The Y component, the M is just zero. That one I don't have to worry about. But this is actually a little bit better notation in terms of I can handle a vertical line very easily. And so now to generalize, you know, we can now generalize to higher dimensions. So the general equation of a line. So we have some point P naught and a direction V. The line is P of T is P naught plus T times V, or X of T is, say, X naught plus T ZX dot, 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 all the way down to whatever the last one is. You know, Z of T is Z naught plus T VZ. So I can write down equations of lines, you know, very generally. And if you look at this, it should hopefully be clear that it's a line. What's the dimension of a line? How many dimensions does a line have? Why two? One, a line has one dimension. How many dimensions does a plane have? Two, how many does a box have? Three. So for a line, I can really describe where I am on the line once I know my starting point by just telling me how long do I travel in a given direction? 
And if you look at the equation now, you can see that this is a one dimensional object. There's one free variable. So one free variable, this is one dimension. What's really going on is, you know, here's the point P naught. Here is my vector V. And then I'll just do it as, you know, here's my line. And I just take any point here and I just tell you how many copies of V do I need to flow until I get to that point. If I take T equals zero, I'm here. If I take T equals one, I'm here. If I take T equals two, I should roughly be there. So this is the equation of a line. So one dimensional object anchored at a point. When we're doing calculus, the point is going to be the point where we want to differentiate. It's going to be where the action happens. Well, building on our wonderful success in equations of lines, what do you think the next thing we should study? After a line, we should study planes. So equation of a non-degenerate plane. So my input will be some point P naught and two independent directions that say V and W. I could do V1 and V2, I'll do V and W. When I say independent, I don't want V and W to be in the same direction. So is a square a rectangle? So when you say rectangle, could you be thinking of a square? Yes. And so for some things, this is really convenient because it means I don't have to do enough analysis to determine whether or not it's a square. I just need to know, does it have four sides? Are, they, are the angles all right angles? Are the sides you know, equal in pairs? That's all I need to do. But it might be nice to know whether or not I have a rectangle. It might be nice to have stronger language like that. How many of you vaguely remember taking a class called geometry? You might have different things about you know, rhombuses and parallelograms and all that stuff as to, if I tell you it's this, does that mean it's this and not something else? And if I tell you you have an isosceles triangle, is an equilateral triangle isosceles? Isosceles means you have what? Two sides, Two sides that are the same or exactly two sides are the same, which way is it defined? I think it's defined so that you have two sides that are equal. So all equilateral triangles are isosceles, but it might be nice to know if somebody tells you I have an isosceles triangle, ah, it's isosceles, but not equilateral. So you just have to decide what do you want your words to mean? The universe doesn't care. It's just when we're having conversations, let's be clear what things mean. When I'm talking about a plane, I really want to have two independent directions. I don't really want to say V and W are in the same direction. In your travels, if you've ever been in Manhattan in New York, what are the two directions we should use? If you're in Manhattan. So when you're walking in Manhattan, east, west, and north, south. You could, of course, use east, west and say, Northeast, Southwest, if you want. It's not the most convenient, but that's fine. If you use East, West and West, East, that's a terrible choice. Those two directions are essentially the same. They differ by a minus sign. They're not gonna span all of Manhattan. You'll just be walking in a straight line. So we need two directions that are independent. And there's more than one choice. And depending on what choice you get, the equation of the plane might look different. This is like if I go to a quadratic and I want to find its roots. If I multiply A, B, and C by two, does it change the roots of the quadratic? No. I can just pull out a two and then it's the same quadratic as before. The polynomial might look different, but it's the same. We saw that a moment ago when we were looking at here where we multiplied the vector and called it two, two M rather than one M. Well, that's now equivalent to using t equals 2s. So 
So we're just changing how quickly we're going through things. It's the same geometric object, but now one S corresponds to two T. Okay. So when I write down the equation, depending on my choice for the vectors V and W, the resulting equation could look a little different, but it's gonna be the same geometric object. This is what you do in linear algebra. So a lot of times some schools do a year long course, multivariable calculus and linear algebra. So you learn linear algebra first up to a certain point. And then when you do multivariable calculus, you then have the language at your disposal. The problem is you have to commit to doing a year of math. I mean, to me, it's like, of course, sure, give me the problem. But you know, there's advantages to learning the linear algebra. If you continue, it then becomes easier to go back and revisit what we're doing right now in linear algebra. I mean, what we're doing right now in multivariate calculus. So let's look at the equation of a plane. So if I had to guess, so the output would be my point P of T would be P naught, oh, sorry, not P of T. I need two variables. So we'll do T and S will be P naught plus T of V plus S of W. And that would be the equation of a plane anchored at the point P naught. And so now, you know, looking at my terrible drawing, my daughter is homesick. I was hoping that she'd be willing, you know, feeling good enough to actually draw things for me. Uh, but no, all right. So I'm using green to be my anchor point. So here, I'm coming up here. Here's my point P naught. And now I have two different directions. So here's V and here's W. And then I can look at all things in this plane. And that's going to be the plane containing the point P naught and the vectors V and W. And we can see that this really does look two dimensional. My variables are T and S. If I wanted to have a three dimensional hyperplane in you know, four dimensional space, I would just have maybe T1, V1 plus T2, V2 plus T3, V3. And so typically what you have is you have one dimension less than the space you're looking at. So in two dimensions, the line was one dimension less. In three space, the plane is one dimension less. And once we get there, we just say hyperplane from that point onward. And the idea is if I have a nice function of one variable that's differentiable near a point of differentiability, the function looks like a straight line. If I have a function of two variables that's differentiable near the point of differentiability, it's gonna look like a plane. If I have a function of three variables near a point of differentiability, it's gonna look like a hyperplane. This is one way of defining a plane. I need a base point and I need two directions. If I give you different directions, I can get a different equation for the plane. It's still the same plane, but it could look different, okay? So for example, I could have, you know, P naught plus TV plus SW and P naught plus, let's say, UV plus, um, I'll say Q V plus W. So let's say those are my two vectors. Okay. If T, I'm sorry, if V and W are in different directions, so is hopeful, so is V and V plus W. So let's try to figure out what the conversion factor is. So I claim that there should be a way to convert between the two of them. So say you know, P naught plus TV plus S W equals P naught plus UV plus Q V plus W. Well, I can clearly cancel the P naughts from both sides. So TV plus S W would be U plus Q V plus Q W. Okay. 
So if I give you T and S, then what should I take U to be and what should I take Q to be? So if I give you T and S, if I give you a point with these coordinates, what should U be, what should Q be? One of them I think is easier to solve than the other. Which is easier, U or Q? So I want TV plus SW to be U plus QV plus QW. Which do you think is easy to find, Q or U plus Q? Q. And so what would Q have to be? Yeah, I want, the, if I have the SW equaling the QW, so I take Q to be S. And now Q equals S, I want U plus S to be T. So you should just be T minus S. T minus S or T minus Q? Um, T minus S, because I'm trying to write U and Q in terms of T and S. Oh. Now, of course, S does equal Q, but I want to be given T and S, and I want to output a U and a Q. So I'm changing my coordinates. You know, depending on the problem, some coordinates are easier than others. If you've done polar coordinates in high school, you've seen that for problems with circular symmetry, rather than using X and Y, it's often easier to use R and theta. Or if you want to be a pompous theta, right? What if we went the other way? What if I was given U and Q? Then I would want to find what should T be? What should S be? So now I know U and Q. Well, I think this one's a little bit easier. What does T equal? So if I want to satisfy this equation, what should T equal if I want TV plus SW to be U plus QV plus QW? It's just U plus Q. And what should S be? That should just be Q. And so, if I change my vectors, if I use V and V plus W as my two directions rather than V and W, that's fine. The equations will look a little bit different. The variables will look a little bit different, but the actual object that I'm expressing will be the same. If you watch a football game, what do they measure distance in football? Yeah, could they measure distance in feet? Yeah, could they measure distance in the metric system. Yes. And I remember listening to a football game where they said it's going to be close, it's going to be a matter of centimeters, millimeters, which one is smaller. And then listening to the football announcers trying to remember which is smaller, a centimeter or a millimeter, in a game that's measured in the English system. This might be one reason why you shouldn't be switching from the English system when announcing football. But does it matter if you want to do that? No. You can use whatever system you want as long as you're consistent, as long as you make sure you convert accordingly. And so depending on the problem, some things might be easier to use than others. We talked about equations of ellipses. If the ellipses are aligned with the coordinate axes, use the coordinate axes. If it's at a 45 degree angle, lean back at a 45 degree angle and do it that way. All right, so this gives us a way to find equations of lines. Now, there is another way to do an equation of a, uh, of a line in the plane. There is another way. There's the normal approach. And so imagine I give you some plane over here. And the plane has some base point. So here's my P naught. Here's the center of my coordinate system. And now imagine. I have some vector here, this normal direction. And then every vector in the plane that works is going to be perpendicular to this direction. So another way of saying the equation of the plane is the plane is all points P such that P minus P naught is perpendicular. We sometimes say orthogonal, so it sounds a little bit more you know, 
high level. And we sometimes just write the perpendicular sign to the normal direction. That's a terrible writing. Normal direction n. So we have the equation p minus p naught is perpendicular to n. And if you think about it, in three-dimensional space, what does it mean to be perpendicular to n? Well, all the things that's perpendicular to a given vector, you know, all things that form 90 degrees, it's going to spin around and it's going to give me a plane. So this is another way to write down the equation of a plane. If I can solve what it means to find all the points p, such that p minus p naught is perpendicular to s. This is not the way we normally write down equations. Yeah. Normally, we don't write down equations with a perpendicular symbol. This is obviously only useful if there's a really nice way of finding what does it mean for two vectors to be perpendicular. P minus P naught, that's easy. That's a subtraction problem. I can do that. But how do I easily find when something is perpendicular? Well, not surprisingly, that's the next part of today's lecture. It's the dot product. So the dot product, sometimes called the inner product. And so V dot W, or sometimes they write, I think VW like this is V1 W1 plus dot 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 plus Vn Wn. So the way I'm going to take the dot product of two vectors is I'm going to just multiply component by component and add. It's not initially clear that this is a useful thing to do. Turns out it is. We've actually seen this before. So recall the length of V is the square root of V1 squared plus dot 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 plus Vn squared, or the length of V squared is V1 squared plus dot 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 plus Vn squared. But that's just V dotted with V. So we've actually seen the dot product before. The dot product of a vector with itself gives its length. And since we have real numbers, each component is clearly going to be non-negative. Why can't I say positive? Why do I have to say non-negative? So why do I have to say non-negative and not every component has to be positive? Yeah, some of the entries could be zero. Zero squared is zero. But if one of the entries is negative, you know, negative five, well, negative five times negative five is 25. Yes. So this would be the Euclidean length, yes. We have to be careful if we have complex numbers rather than having a dot product like this would be V1 times the complex conjugate of W1. And so if you have complex numbers, you have to be a little bit more careful. We'll just be working with real numbers, so it's not going to be an issue with us. OK, so now, why is this useful? Oops. It turns out the dot product, if I can get this, OK, has some very nice properties. So it turns out v dot w is the length of v, length of w times the cosine of the angle between them. Or solving for the cosine of the angle, it's v dot w over length of v, length of w. Two vectors are perpendicular if and only if their dot product is zero. You can also use this to take the projection of a vector along another vector. So for example, if I have this vector u, I can break up u into two components, a part that's um, parallel to the direction of v and a part that's perpendicular to the direction of v. And so here, um, this will be the direction v over here. And so what I want to say is, how much of u is going in this direction? And there's a very simple formula for that using the dot product. Well, if you think about it, if we remember our trigonometry, this length here is going to be the hypotenuse times the cosine of theta. Right? So by trig, it's just um, hypotenuse 
times cosine of the angle. And the cosine of the angle, well, we actually have a formula for the cosine of the angle and the hypotenuse. Um, so we can go through and just get all of our stuff. All right. So and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's try to explain why this is true. The first thing is, is this formula reasonable? So we have V dot W is the length of V times the length of W times the cosine of the angle between V and W. If I double V and triple W, so let's say we double V and we triple W. What happens to the left-hand side? So all the entries in V are doubled, all the entries in W are doubled. What happens to V dot W? I'm sorry? Wait, so how much would V1, W1 change if I double V and triple W? What happens to V1, W1? I've doubled V, I've tripled W. So V1 is twice what it was, W1 is three times what it was. What's V1, W1 now? It's increased by a factor of six. What about Vn, Wn? It increases by a factor of six. So each term increases by a factor of six. And then the right-hand side, You know, what happens to the length of V is increased by a factor of what? If I double all the entries of V, what happens to the length of V? So if I double all the entries of V, what's gonna to happen to the length of V? It will double. And what about the length of W if I triple every entry? It's increased by a factor of three. And the cosine of the angle, does the angle change? You know, if I had, you know, V and W, and now I double V and I triple W, does the angle change? No, cosine theta is unchanged. So it's reasonable. It doesn't prove that this formula is correct, but it scales properly. It scales as it should. Okay. So it's scaling exactly as I would expect. So there's a hope that something like this is true. We actually know that this formula is true in the special case when V equals W, because when V equals W, the angle would be zero. What's the cosine of zero? Cosine of zero is, is one. So we know the formula is true in the special case when the angle is zero. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to prove this in general. So I need to use some more trig. Cosines. So if I give you a triangle, make sure this is not somebody trying to get into the class. Oh, it's not. Okay, so I can give you a triangle. Let's see which way do I want to do this? I'll do it this way. C, A, and B. Then C squared is A squared plus B squared minus two AB cosine of theta where the angle is the angle opposite. So this should be vaguely familiar, right? This is something you should have seen in trigonometry, pre-calculus, something like that. Okay, how many people remember seeing this? Oh dear Lord. Maybe this is just one of the 
many consequences of the pandemic response is that certain material was omitted. Um, is there any choice of angle that you might have a better understanding of? Any choice of theta where you might recognize what this is? What's a good value of theta to give me? 90, if I take theta equals 90, that yields C squared is A squared plus B squared. Oh, we know what that is. That's the Pythagorean formula. We've proven that already. So let's prove this. So the way you prove almost anything of importance in geometry is you draw an auxiliary line. And this is to some extent the method of divine inspiration. I'm gonna draw this line. And you see that when you draw it, everything works out nicely. What kind of triangles do we like? Right triangles. So I wanna draw lines in such a way that I have a right triangle. I have to be careful because when I draw the triangle like this, maybe I can't draw the altitude coming from this vertex at the top all the way down to the side B. Maybe that's somehow outside the triangle. I'm not gonna worry about drawing all the pictures. I'm just gonna do this special case. You could make this argument work in general, okay? So let's draw a line like this and call this H. Let's call this X. And then what would the rest of this distance be? It would be B minus X. Okay. Well, now we have two right triangles. And so we'll call them triangle one and triangle two because we have no creativity. In triangle one, we get C squared is equal to X squared plus H squared or H squared is C squared minus X squared. In triangle two, we have A squared is b minus x squared plus h squared, or h squared is b minus x, I'm sorry, is a squared minus b minus x squared. Oh, I have two different formulas for h, right? So I know, h squared is c squared minus x squared, which is a squared minus b minus x squared. So c squared is a squared plus x squared minus b minus x squared. That's gonna be minus b squared, oh, don't make a mistake. Um, Uh, so it's b squared minus 2bx plus x squared. Oh, I think I've got my sides wrong as to how I want to do things. Um, let's see. So c squared minus x squared is h squared. a squared is h squared minus All right, so I think it was just gonna be a little bit wrong. That's right. So I'll have to change it. So I'm gonna get a squared. I'm gonna have a minus x squared and a plus x squared that's gonna cancel. I'm gonna have a minus b squared, right? And I'm gonna have a plus two bx. So I'm gonna get c squared plus b squared minus two bx equals a squared. All right, sorry about that. So I'm gonna call this angle phi. With the law of cosines, I would also get a squared is going to be c squared plus b squared minus two bc cosine phi. Is basically, I can take any two sides and I can express the third in terms of those two sides, those other two sides and the angle between them. 
So if I want to get C, I can get C in terms of A, B, and the angle between A and B. If I want A, I can get A in terms of C, B, and the angle between. So I, I, I drew my right angle the wrong way for this problem. So, okay. So now I've got C squared plus B squared minus 2BX equals A squared. That's almost A squared is C squared plus B squared minus 2BC cosine phi. So all I need to do is show that X equals C cosine phi. Well, if you look at this, I have a right triangle. Here's phi, here's C, here's 90 degrees. So this is just gonna be C times the cosine of phi and that's X. So we're done as C times cosine of phi equals X. So we just replace X with C cosine phi and we get what we want. So this is a proof of the law of cosines. So the law of cosine says, if I give you any side, its length squared is the sum of the squares of the other two lengths minus the product of their lengths times the cosine of the angle between them. Okay, well now imagine I give you, here's B, here's W, and then what do you think this vector would be to get us from W to V. What do I have to add to W to get V? So if I give you two and I wanna add something to get five, what do I add to two to get five? I'm sorry? How can I write three in a way that's illuminating? Five minus two. If I give you 17, what do I have to add to 17 to get 11? Nope. 11 minus 17. What do I have to add to W to get V? V minus W. So if I look at it like this, and I call that my angle theta, by the law of cosines, I would get V minus W, its length squared is the length of V squared plus the length of W squared minus two length of V, length of W, cosine of the angle. Okay, well, what is V minus W, its length squared is V minus W dotted with V minus W. And so what you need to do is you need to go through the reading and see that the dot product has all the relations you would expect it to have. So, you know, A, V, dotted with W is A times V dotted with W and U plus V dotted with W is U dotted with W plus V. Whoops, it's a terrible overline. Is V dotted with W. So basically I have distributive rules. And again, you can go through this, roll up your sleeves and just write down, what does it mean to do V minus W? This is V one minus W one comma, V two minus W two comma. And you do it component by component by component. So you would just do your V one minus W one, V two minus W two dot dot dot, dotted with V one minus W one dot 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 dot. You'd get V one minus W one squared, plus dot, 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 dot. And you would keep arguing to show that you can do all of this. And so when we're looking at what V minus W squared, this was V minus W dotted with V minus W, 
this becomes v dot v minus w dot v minus v dot w plus w dot w. Well, that's the length of v squared from the first. And w dot v is the same as v dot w. Because your v1, w1 is the same as w1, v1. Doesn't matter the order in which I do them. So I get minus two v dot w plus the length of w squared. And we know from before that this was equal to the length of v squared plus the length of w squared minus two length of v length of w cosine of the angle by the law of cosines. And that's what we just had on the last page. You know, by the law of cosines, v dot w squared is length of v squared plus length of w squared minus twice that product. We had a good way of writing v minus w. And now look and see how many things cancel. They both have a length of v squared, gone. They both have a length of w squared, gone. They both have a minus two, gone, right? And we're left with v dot w is the length of v, length of w times the cosine of theta. What's really nice about this is we're doing this without going through all the different coordinates and writing it down. This is something that holds in great generality. So when I do v dot w, I get cosine of theta times the product of lengths, or the cosine of theta is v dot w over the length of v times the length of w. And so if theta equals pi halves, then v dot w equals zero, we have a perpendicular test. So when we talked about finding an equation of a plane, when we were using, you know, I want to find all vectors perpendicular, we now actually have a way to use this. So for the plane, if I have the point P naught and a normal, say, A, B, C, then the equation of the plane is all points X, Y, Z such that X, Y, Z minus X naught, Y naught, Z naught dotted with A, B, C equals zero or A, X minus X naught plus B, Y minus Y naught, I'm sorry, um, plus C, Z minus Z naught equals zero or A X plus B Y plus C Z is just going to be P naught dotted with the normal vector. And we sometimes call that constant in an absolute shocker D as the next letter in the alphabet after A, B, and C. This is another way of writing the equation of a plane. If I give you the normal direction A, B, C, it's all points X, Y, Z, such that A, X plus B, Y plus C, Z is just P naught dotted with N. If you think about this, how many dimensions should a plane have in three-dimensional space? So how many dimensions is a plane? Two. So what that means is I should have two free variables. So once I choose two of x, y, and z, the third should be forced. Well, if you look at this, once I choose x and y, now z is forced. It's got to be whatever I need to make this work. If I choose y and z, then that's going to determine what x is. I should be able to solve for any in terms of the other. What's the only thing I have to be careful about? And we had this issue with lines. What's the one thing I've got to be careful about? So for lines, I want to say I can always write my slope vector as 1 comma m. But that's not always the case. What was the one thing we had to be careful about? Yeah, if, if it was zero in the x-coordinate, there's no way for me to rescale. If a equals zero, I can't choose y and z willy-nilly and then say x can just make up the leftover. No, I can't if a equals zero. 
So as long as A is not zero, I can choose Y and Z freely, and then X can just be whatever it needs to be. All right, so this finishes the equation of uh, planes and whatnot. And in a perfect set of, you know, guessing how much space was needed, uh, no extra space and listing here what the homework problems are. All right, so this is a good place to stop. So these are the problems that will be due for the next class. And then we will continue with the next section and we will start to see more consequences of this. So again, right now we're just building up the language.